the grace, the mercy, and the peace of God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, be and abide with each one of you. Amen. Well, today we are starting a series of sermons through the month of September, focusing upon the cost of discipleship. Now, I think today's gospel reading definitely brings that out and gets us on to a good start because we have the Lord Jesus saying to his disciples and even saying to us, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Gracious God and Father, we thank and praise you for making us part of your family. You have bestowed upon us the Holy Spirit, who through the waters of baptism united us with Christ, with his death and his resurrection. You have given to us in Jesus Christ a Savior, who has given us also life and salvation, all through the forgiveness of sins, worked by him. We ask that you work within our hearts today, as we, your disciples, consider the great cost of discipleship to which you have called us. Lord Jesus, bless us and open our hearts to your word, letting your spirit work within us, we pray. Amen. You know, that cost of discipleship may sound familiar to some of you. Uh, and it, You may have read the book. Remember that book? You know who also is attributed as the author of that book because it's a compiling of, of his writings is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who's a Lutheran pastor, theologian, scholar, lecturer from Germany. He lectured and was part of the church during the rise of the Nazi regime in Germany. Dietrich Bonhoeffer became part of what was referred to in the Lutheran church, the confessing church, because they refused to be intimidated by the Nazis they refused to speak the political correctness that was required of them according to Nazi understanding and propaganda. And then right along with that, Bonhoeffer also became a co-conspirator in an assassination attempt or a plot that was foiled, sadly, upon Adolf Hitler. And from that he was arrested, he was put in various prisons, and in 1943, he was finally moved to the concentration camp in Flossenburg. And then on April 9th, 1945, he was hanged. And just a few days later, the Allied forces liberated the Flossenburg concentration camp. While he was in prison, he ministered to guards as well as his fellow prisoners. In fact, the guards were the ones who smuggled out much of his work and saw that it was preserved and spread. All of this that Bonhoeffer did, even leading up to his death, he put under the heading of the cost of discipleship. Now, when we talk in terms of the cost of discipleship, we don't fully understand the cost, nor do we even want to. Because in our present day understanding of being a disciple of Christ is pretty easy. We don't have to suffer. We don't have to put our life on the line like he did and like many of our Christian brothers and sisters throughout the world are still doing. The cost of discipleship, according to Bonhoeffer, is very great. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to die for your faith but it's definitely going to impact your faith as you live it out on this side of eternity. The cost of discipleship is all around those words, if anyone would follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow. Jesus said those words at a beautiful place called Caesarea Philippi. As the, the name gives way, it was a Roman-influenced area. Caesarea Philippi was a beautiful place. It was lush and green, had trees in usually a very barren land. 
the springs were coming out of the rocks. And there was a rock ledge, and still is, a rock ledge that's just a sheer cliff going all the way up. And little niches over the centuries have been carved in it, and pagan gods' statues have been put there. And this was the place where Jesus chose to relax in the cool under the trees and with the spring with his disciples. These springs fed into the Sea of Galilee. They fed into the Jordan River eventually. And Jesus was relaxing with his disciples away from the, what would dare we say, the maddening crowds. Because everywhere he went, they pressed on him, pressed on him, and he never turned down an opportunity to proclaim the word of God and to also heal them of all kinds of diseases. They were the ones who continually you know, were pressing him, and finally he broke away and with his disciples came here to rest. And while he was resting there, he asked a question. As he looked, I'm sure, at all of those statues in those niches, who do people say I am? And they answered, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, come back from the dead, some say a prophet. And then he asked a very pointed question, who do you say I am? And Peter's powerful confession rang out, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responded, hey Peter, those words didn't come from you, those came from the Holy Spirit. And upon that confession, I will build my church. And then Jesus became very intimate with them. He shared with them his approaching death and resurrection. He said to them, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. To which Peter, that powerful confessor, said, no way, Lord, we won't let that happen. We will fight to save you. We will fight for you. We're not going to let that happen. To which Jesus responded, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And then he called them to consider the cost of discipleship. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He must deny himself. Wow. Commentator said that those three things that Jesus said about discipleship were like a person going on a journey. You first say your farewells, only Jesus was talking about saying a farewell not to other people, but to yourself. Take up your luggage, your baggage, the cross, and proceed on the journey, follow me. The cost of discipleship begins with denial. In our very pampered and self-indulgent society, denial is a hard word for us to consider. We don't like to give up stuff that makes us feel good. We don't like to give up attitudes that justify us. Living in denial can be a downer. Denial can be a downer when we use it as a self-preservation tactic. And that comes naturally for us because we inherited that from our first parents. They did it when they were busted by the Creator in the garden. They denied. Cain, their son, denied killing his brother Abel when God called him on the carpet. When it's used as an excuse for, to justify our wrongful motives and actions, it's a downer. Denial can be a downer when we focus only upon our, our desires, upon our own self. Peter and the other disciples desired to reign with Christ on earth in an earthly kingdom. That's why Peter was going to fight for him. Their biggest question among themselves was, which one of us is going to be the greatest when he comes into his kingdom? Remember that argument? And remember Mama coming, James and John? Will you let one of them sit on your left and the other on your right when you come into your kingdom? That's what it was all about. The Jewish leaders desired a Messiah who was going to establish a, a, a kingdom here on earth who would rout those Romans. And yet we too 
also deny God's will and working in our own life when we just focus upon what we want and what we desire. We let the face of Jesus be eclipsed by our own shadow. Living in denial can be a downer, but it can also be divine. Jesus does not call us to self-denial of earthly things or actions. You know, it's really, when we give up things, for instance, when Lent comes, people deal with the question, I wonder what I'm going to give up. Well, does that benefit God? No, that just makes you feel good. When you don't chew the gum, when you don't uh, drink coffee or something like that, that doesn't make anybody feel good. When you don't go, what am I saying? Let's forget the coffee part. Let's just say the gum, okay? But whenever you deal with this, you know, when we give up something, it, it makes us feel good. Jesus isn't talking about giving up things. He's talking about denying ourself. And when we deny ourself, then we have to put him as number one. He has to come first, and we then, living in denial, we focus on him and him alone. We no longer live for ourselves. We live for Christ. Bonhoeffer wrote that he goes ahead of us and we are simply to hold fast to him. Living in denial means to take up our cross. Taking up the cross is a mark of discipleship, Jesus says. Discipleship is coupled with death, drowning the old man and the old Adam. But it's also coupled with life and resurrection. The new man daily coming forth and arising. It doesn't mean an end to a good life. It means the beginning of a new one, a greater one. Living in denial means to deny self, to take up your cross and follow Jesus. Some Christians can't do this by themselves. None of us can. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit is that even possible. And the Holy Spirit is the one who embraces us in the waters of holy baptism with his grace and enables us to decide, become a disciple, to follow Jesus. Jesus Christ gives us the example of divinely living in denial. He denied the easy road to glory. Three years before this, Jesus had been baptized by John the baptizer. He was sent by the Spirit out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and it even leaves it open that the devil tempted him throughout that 40 days and 40 nights as he grew weaker and weaker. And yet, the three temptations recorded by Matthew and Luke include one where, in, according to Matthew, it's almost in desperation that the devil throws this one out. He takes him up to a high mountain and he shows him all the glory, the glitter, and the glamour of the world. And he says, hey, this is mine to give. It all belongs to me and I will give it to you if you bow down and worship me. That's all you have to do. Jesus, if you bow down and worship me, you don't have to go the way of the cross. The devil knew exactly why Jesus had come. You don't have to go the way of the cross. You don't have to go through the, the cross in order to get to the crown. I'm going to give it all to you today. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. And Jesus' response was, get behind me, Satan. Even Peter here at Caesarea Philippi tempted him in a very similar way when he talked about dying, being killed. Don't talk like that. Don't talk about suffering and dying. We'll protect you. We'll fight for you. We'll save you. And Jesus said to him, Get behind me, Satan. Wow. Your will is getting in the will, the way of God's will. Jesus chose to live in denial of taking the easy road to glory. He denied himself of earthly glory and he chose instead the cross. And he calls us to do the same. What does the cross entail? Paul talked about that in Romans chapter 12. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, 
Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly, never be conceited, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. That's discipleship. There's a cost to that because all that Paul says is something that we don't like to do. When someone offends us, we're going to get back. We're going to get even. That's how we're made. Thank you, Adam and Eve. But it is through the power of baptism that we are different. We have been made different. So much so that living in denial of ourselves means going where Christ leads. You know, I highly recommend to you periodically to raid the children's busy bags. There's some really neat things in there. Here's a little pony, for instance. Isn't that cute? I tell you, and you, some of you kids may have been looking for this today. It's mine. Let me just... Notice what this is. You know, in baptism, something strange takes place. We are threads. And the Holy Spirit, through the grace of baptism, threads us through what is in a needle? The eye threads us through that eye of the needle, and Jesus is the needle. And this is what the cost of discipleship is all about. If from that point on, where does the thread go? Wherever the needle goes. Wherever the needle leads, the thread goes. Watch. I know, you guys, this is highly unusual for you to even understand what I'm doing here. Look at that. And if the needle wants to go over here, then guess where the thread goes? Right with it. Can you imagine? That's what we are about. That's the cost of discipleship. Going where the needle goes. Going where Christ goes. Letting Him lead, and we simply follow. It means bearing up our brothers and sisters in need. And it also means placing ourselves in uncomfortable situations in order to serve. But in so doing, we realize the cost of discipleship is going where Jesus leads us, like a needle leading a thread. And we realize what Jesus means by, if you want to save your life, is it? God's peace. Amen. Now may that peace that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.